half of the western bracket in Seattle. Let's go up to Tim Brandt. The Seattle Supersonics continued their dominance over the teams from Texas. First, the Sonics eliminated Dallas. Now they have jumped up on Houston three games to one in the best of seven series as they head back to Houston. This game was a very physical, emotional ball game. This is a club, Seattle, which finished the regular season with a sub-500 record. Now the Sonics are playing like champions. Tom Chambers was the catalyst, taking the ball right at the Houston big men. The 6'10 veteran from Utah was in command. While Akeem Olajuwon and Ralph Sampson got into foul trouble, Chambers scored a game-high 38 points. He pulled down eight rebounds to lead this team, which has two rookies and seven players which arrived this season. I didn't know we'd all come together, eight new bodies, and be able to perform this way. It's just been a, a fairy tale season for the Super Suns. We've got, come back up into the rakes in the NBA in one season when we all figured it would take a few. Seattle head coach Bernie Bickerstaff orchestrated a brilliant victory. And as Seattle Supersonics now move on to Houston with a 3-1 to one lead in the best of seven series and the attention of the entire NBA, Seattle is for real. I'm Tim Brandt for CBS Sports. And there is no truth to the rumor that the Supersonics are changing their name to the surprising Supersonics. Lakers and Golden State game four later on this afternoon. You know, playoff memories are being made right now. The plays you are watching today are indeed the highlights of the future. With that in mind, let's dig into the At The Half history book and look back at two memorable playoff contests. Thirteen years ago, it was game six in Boston. The Celtics led the Bucks by one with seven seconds left in double overtime. Kareem Skyhook forced the game seven, but then John Havlicek took over. Hondo averaged 26.4 points in the series and was named the MVP as Boston defeated Milwaukee four games to three and won the 1974 NBA World Championship. In 1980, the Lakers title hopes looked slim when Kareem Abdul-Jabbar hobbled off the floor in game five. Los Angeles was forced to use a rookie named Irvin Johnson at center and he responded with pure magic. One of the finest all-around games in NBA playoff history. 42 points, 15 rebounds, 7 assists, as the Lakers beat the 76ers four games to two. You know, looking at those highlights, you recognize a lot of Hall of Famers and, in fact, a lot of future Hall of Famers. And this week up in Springfield, Massachusetts, they inducted five more basketball greats. It's that time of year again, and let's profile some of them. To me, it's the ultimate honor that I think a player can receive because this is as high as you can go. And when you think of all the players that have played in the NBA and, and the number of guys that are in the Hall of Fame, they're very few. The dreams that I had as a child didn't reach the clouds of the Hall of Fame. Uh, they were a lot lower. My, my, my goals were a lot lower. My goals were basically to be on that championship team and get that ring. And yet here I am today receiving an even greater ring. It's something that you think about when you're growing up, at least I know that I did. I kind of related to the championship being the cake and this being the icing on the cake. A lot of people were responsible to your teammates. You have to give credit, you know, your coaches, uh, even your opponents who made you reach for that little extra sometimes to bring out your greatness. Dad passed away two weeks ago and to be in the Hall of Fame, it was really a dream that uh, fulfilled him. As the induction was getting closer and closer. I felt my emotions growing and growing with it. And I really think that once the induction is over and the years go on, that'll probably mean more and more to me. And along with those three players, two other greats from the 50s are honored. They are Bobby Wanzer and Bob Hubrex. They will also be remembered forever. A couple of graduation notes here before we get you back to the ball game. Oklahoma's Brian Bosworth graduated yesterday. He will enter the NFL supplemental draft. And today, Isaiah Thomas graduated from Indiana. Uh, he's a little busy, so he sent his mother to go pick up his degree. A mother's work is never over. Last we heard, Isaiah Thomas, the graduate, already has work. We're going to get you back to the game now, and Brenton Billy, as at the half, rolls on for moms and Eastern Conference playoff fixture. But first, 
Let me talk to you about some playoffs that took place tonight on the ice. It was game six in the Wales Conference Finals between Philadelphia and Montreal. And the Flyers skated past the defending Stanley Cup champions. It was a wild one. Ten minutes before the game even began, these players were trading punches. But when action started, it was the Canadiens coming out flying as Mike McPhee blasted the first score of the game, 1-0. However, the Flyers did battle back. They tied the game at 3-all in the second period on that Scott Mellonby goal. One player the Flyers have to be pleased with who's had a great playoff series is Rick Tockett. He comes up and scores the game winner in the third period as the Flyers advance to the finals to take on the Edmonton Oilers by the score of 4-3. to three. Meanwhile, the defending NBA champion Boston Celtics are leading the Milwaukee Bucks three games to two in that Eastern Conference semifinal series, but the Celtics continue to be plagued by injuries. Already, Kevin McHale, of course, is hampered by ankle and foot injuries. Bill Walton has set out the last three games with foot problems, and now center Robert Parrish will definitely only missed game six because of an ankle sprain. Pat O'Brien has more on the Boston Celtics' woes as they prepare to take on Milwaukee tomorrow. I think that tonight uh, we, we sort of took it for granted that we were going to win. We, we played well, but we didn't play well enough. I'm really surprised, to tell you the truth. To tell you the truth, nothing could save the Celtics last night. Not Larry Bird, not the Chief, not the parquet floor, not even a 33-game winning streak in the Garden. We know it's hard to, to win in here, but uh, when you talk about pressure, it's even. Uh, it's pressure to win the game you're playing, and it's as simple as it is, really. Milwaukee came out and played a simple game of run and shoot. These weren't bucks. These were gazelles. They moved so well last night, you thought the Garden had lost its intimidation factor. This team also has something Boston does not. It's called a bench. Boston only plays maybe one or two other people off the bench, and we play quite a few more. We probably play about nine to ten players consistently, so in that sense, I think that we have more depth. Take a look at the playing time, and you know why depth has been a word you don't hear much in Boston. The best five-man team in the league has carried the load. The reserves have been more like casual visitors. To add insult to injury, last night, Robert Parrish went down with a sprained ankle. And the Celtics arrived in Milwaukee tonight without the Chief. That's unfortunate. Uh, you hate to see anybody get hurt any time there, especially now. Um, but, you know, we've all been hurt before, and I, you know, that, that, that's one of the things you got to overcome. But they are still the defending champs, and the Bucks are still pretenders. And we're going to worry about Friday night first. We feel that we have our hands full. They're going to come out more aggressive. Uh, and our main concern is Friday. We want to play, play to win Friday and worry about Sunday. Well, if we can just uh, bottle up the feeling that we have right now and take it in there with us, we'll be all right. Pat O'Brien, CBS Sports. Finals in the Eastern Conference. As a matter of fact, this will be the first time that the Pistons have advanced to the finals in the conference since 1962 when they played the Los Angeles Lakers in the Western Conference. Last night, the Detroit Pistons got a hero's welcome in Detroit. As a matter of fact, it was 1.30 in the morning when a bunch of enthusiastic fans, diehard fans, showed up and gave the Detroit Pistons a hero's welcome. God, this team amazing. I'm just, I'm, I'm stunned at what's happening. I feel confident that if it got down to the end of the basketball game, uh, I'd do something to make us win. <laughs> And I uh, hope we can carry this to the next series. But uh, it's just not the team victory. It's the, it's the city, the whole state. You know, Isaiah Thomas had a conversation with Magic Johnson a week ago saying to Magic that he wanted to be in the NBA Finals in the worst possible way. And now Isaiah is only one series away from making that happen. Well, speaking of Magic Johnson, he has a list of players that received awards this week. The Magic Man was voted by his peers as the Sporting News Player of the Year. And his teammate, Michael Cooper, was NBA media selection as Defensive Player of the Year, while Indiana's Chuck Person today was announced as the league's Rookie of the Year. He outdistanced runner-up Ron Harper of the Cleveland Cavaliers. And one other NBA note, today attorneys for Band New Jersey net guard Michael Ray Richardson met with league counsel Gary Bettman to discuss the player's malpractice suit against Dr. Russell First. Make that for Standick, who happens to be Richardson's previous drug therapist. Well, Richardson's attorneys contend that his drug relapse was due to First Standick's mishandling. The topic of early reinstatement for Richardson was also raised, but in accordance with league rules, his case and request for reinstatement will not be reviewed until February 1988, two years from the date that he was originally expelled from the league 
and indeed, reinstatement is not automatic. All right, let's talk a little bit about the Seattle Supersonics. There's no question that their success during the playoffs has got this town buzzing and indeed thinking back to the glory years of the late 1970s. Well, there was a key player on that squad then who was one of the most popular ever, and his name was Slick Watts. As a matter of fact, Slick Watts was a very distinctive character. Take a look, that shaved head was very familiar as well as his drives down the lane into big man's territory. Now, no one could ever accuse Slick of not being a thinking man's guard because when he had to, he pulled up for the jumper on the outside. Slick Watts, and now while most of us may be aged and get gray hair in our old age, Slick Watts hasn't changed one bit, no gray there. The only thing that's missing is the headband. Do you get a chance to use it much? Well, James, I go out and I play a whole lot of ball, and uh, I stay in shape, and I use it sometimes. Uh, we do fun races across the country. Slick, one thing that I did not mention to our audience is that you played for both the Seattle Supersonics and the Houston Rockets when you were traded by the Sonics in 78. You still have friends playing for the Rockets. Any dilemma as to which team you'll be pulling for? Well, you know, of course, I'm going to go with home. Uh, Seattle, Washington, I've been here uh, all my life almost, other than Rolling Falls, Mississippi. So uh, I'm going with the Seattle Supersonics. A lot of people have been trying to dissect the Sonics to understand the reasons for their success this year. One similarity between the teams in the late 70s that you played for here and the current Seattle team, three players were giving free reign offensively. Jack Sigma, Dennis Johnson, and, and Gus Williams back then. And of course now it's Tom Chambers, Xavier Daniel, and Dale Ellis. Is that a big reason why this team is successful, the unrestricted offensive moves? Well, I, I definitely think so because uh, I remember back in the days when Andrew Tony was playing with uh, Philly. And he's still playing with Philly, and uh, he was looking back to see what the coach wanted to tell him, you know. And he had the ball stole away from him. And I think it puts additional pressure on, a, on, a, on the players when they're out there and they kind of look and see what the coach wanted them to do. Where that uh, Lenny and Bernie kind of let these fellas really play and play loose and keep the pressure off them. Five seconds. Is the city behind this team as they were back in the late 70s? The city is coming back together. It's, it's slowly.